Here's the definition of success. And failure just makes this note. Here's failure. A few errors in judgment repeated every day. Now you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say I can understand that a few errors in judgment repeated every day for six years. I'm with my father. I think I told the story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, has never been ill, still hasn't retired. Not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We've drilled a new well, got some extra water, got some more acres going. He's all excited at midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed, don't have to go to bed hungry. And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said to my father, So healthy, my mom taught us all those good health practices, taught me when I was growing up, right? I'm an only child, I've never been ill, that's the big 5Z. Some time ago, my two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill, my grandkids never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, suddenly it occurred to me, I know that's part of it. An apple a day, that's gotten to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, oh well, Mr. Owen, if that's true, that would be easy to do. Then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy next door says, a Hershey bar a day. Say, oh no, you've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You've got to be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You've got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Sometimes in the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day, doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart, that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment or philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you, the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic, if you look down the road a little, ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25. That's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling, saying, Hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm a 25-year-old American male. I've got a nice family, every reason to do well, and I messed up. Now what's messed up? I used to think it was the community that was messed up, and the country was messed up, and the government was messed up. If those Democrats ever get in the White House, that'll really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that'll really mess things up. The economy was messed up, interest rates were messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out, that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy, my own errors in judgment. And my own personal philosophy brought me, in six years, two pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well. Living in America, a 25-year-old American male, got a family, every reason to do well. Once I understood this, here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. It's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. A guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar, whether it's your money, or whether it's your cholesterol counts. All you've got to do is commit the errors. And just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple, you say, well, I didn't eat an apple today, and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you've got to be brighter than that. Someday, You've got to leave first grade. Reason we make those first grade desks so small is so they won't fit at age 25, I mean, right? You don't belong here anymore. Let me give you the secret to success. 
The formula for failure. A few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month starts the weakness. Starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in years. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practiced every day, and you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits, and with your communication habits, with your sales habits, and management habits, and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors, and replace it with disciplines practiced, I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately after today. You don't ever have to be the same again, only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today, only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Owen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start but with an apple? You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health, and you don't? What'll that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, might means you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn, and either one is called disaster. Could, should, won't. Could, should, don't. That's called disaster. Now how do you change all that? The next six years I got rich. The next six years I became a millionaire. By the time I'm 31 I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well Mr. Owen, what happened? Well strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were nothing. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, and coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life within a six-year period. I was never the same, and I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn ten years ago when he was really terrific. I want people to say, I heard him ten years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you, the man works on his craft. I'm telling you, the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you, the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you, he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. The same thing can happen for you. As a teenager, it can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson, running a business. Doesn't matter. Management. Wherever you find yourself. This is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is, start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines, or continue the errors. That's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. What was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shof said, Mr. Roan, you don't have to change country, but you do have to change direction. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income. You can turn around your bank account. You can turn around your skills. You can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life, using the only stuff there is, and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now, I can spend the whole day on philosophy. That's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you'd pick up the commitment like I did, say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy, 
and then go to the more complicated discipline. Because if you can't handle the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated thoughts? Held in mind, produce after their kind. What you think becomes your reality. Earl Nightingale, in his audio program The Strangest Secret, says that you become what you think about. Ralph Waldo Emerson summarized this idea more than 100 years before by saying, A man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. The law of mind is extremely powerful, and it is, in many ways, a basic law for explaining many of the other laws that refer to mind action. The natural extension of the law of mind is the third law of success, called the law of mental equivalency. This law says that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental equivalent of what you wish to experience in each dimension of your external life. If you want to be happy, you need to clearly define for yourself and create the mental equivalent or picture of exactly what happiness means to you. If you wish to enjoy health and long life, or happy relationships, or financial prosperity, you need to create in your mind an exact detailed picture of what you desire. As a result of a whole series of other laws that I'll be discussing, this becomes the critical starting point that begins, inevitably, to lead you to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success is called the Law of Correspondence. This law has been talked about for perhaps 4,000 years, and it is one of the fundamental laws that explains human experience. It simply says that as within, so without. It says that your outer life will tend to be a mirror image of your inner life. Your external world will tend to correspond almost exactly to what is going on inside both your conscious and subconscious mind. There are four major areas where you see the law of correspondence working all the time. The first is simply in your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, often before you even say anything, people will reflect it back to you in the way they talk to you and treat you. As within, so without. The second area where the law of correspondence is evident is in your relationships. Your relationships will almost perfectly mirror your attitude and your personality. If you're a good and happy person, you'll have good and happy relationships. As you become a more patient, tolerant and loving person, your relationships will reflect this almost immediately, very much as a mirror will do. The third area of correspondence that you see is in your health. Much of your health can be directly traced to specific attitudes that cause you to suffer from minor and major illnesses. The extensive work that's been done in the area of holistic medicine seems to suggest that there are corresponding attitudes of mind for most illnesses that you or I suffer from. The common cold and flu all the way up to the most serious illnesses that are often life-threatening. Whenever you're anxious or upset or unhappy for any reason for any period of time, your body will begin to reflect those feelings. The entire basis of psychosomatic medicine is the conclusion that your mind, psycho, makes your body, soma, sick. What your mind harbors, your body eventually expresses. The fourth application of the law of correspondence is that your external world of material accomplishment will exactly correspond to your internal world of preparation. The more knowledge and skill you gain that helps you to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You can't hope to acquire or achieve anything more on the outside until you've acquired it or achieved it on the inside. The law of correspondence reigns supreme. The fifth law of success is the law of belief, which says that whatever you believe with emotion becomes your reality. You always have a tendency to act in a manner consistent with your innermost beliefs and convictions. Your beliefs, in fact, act like a filter or a screen that edits out incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness the things that you've already decided are true about yourself and the world. William James of Harvard said, Belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible it says, Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For example, if you absolutely believe that you are meant to be a great success in life, and that no matter what happens, nothing can stop you from achieving the greatness that is yours, you'll act in a manner consistent with that belief and you'll eventually make it come true. If you doubt your ability to be successful for any reason, this negative belief will be demonstrated in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the necessity for you to question your own self-limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act like the brakes on your potential. These are the nagging doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their ability that cause them to sell themselves short. When you have self-limiting beliefs, you have a tendency to settle for far less than you may be capable of. Self-limiting beliefs revolve around your ability to lose weight or quit smoking or earn a certain amount of money, 
or be attractive to members of the opposite sex, or develop new abilities that are more conducive to your success and happiness. One of the most important steps you can take toward achieving great success is for you to question these self-limiting beliefs. You might even ask others who know you well what self-limiting beliefs they seem to think that you have that may be holding you back. Remember, self-limiting beliefs are often used as excuses. A good way to test your self-limiting beliefs is to ask yourself whether anyone else with the limitations you perceive you have has nonetheless gone on to achieve success. You can also look at your own actions to decide what it is that you truly value. Remember, it's not what you say or hope or wish or intend that is a true expression of your values and beliefs. It's only what you do. Children are very aware of this and they ignore the advice of their parents when their parents say, do as I say, not as I do. The fact is, we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their innermost convictions. There's a great deal of confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write about it, it means that they truly believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe what you do. Your actions do speak far more loudly than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication, it will be evident in the things that you do every single day. If you truly believe in the values of honesty and integrity and self-discipline, you'll demonstrate these qualities in your every behavior. In fact, you can tell what a person values by looking at what they did in the past when the pressure was on. It's only when they're forced to make a choice that you know what it is you really value. For example, when you have to choose between family and work, or between money and work, or between money and honesty, your true values come out. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistent with them, even if you haven't yet made them a fixed part of your character. I'll explain this later in the program. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by inner desires and urges and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level. Your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations, by what you really want and need in life, not by what you think you want. This is an extension of the law of values, and it's very important for you to understand. There's a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. The ABC stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequences. The antecedents are the things that happen before the behavior. The behavior is the thing that you do. The consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know psychologically only about 15% of your motivation comes from the antecedents, from what you read or learn or told to do or not do. However, about 85% of your motivation comes from your expectations, what you think will happen. It's your beliefs about the consequences, about the future that cause you to behave in a certain way. The clearer you are about the consequences of your actions, and the more intensely you desire to enjoy the consequences that your behaviors may lead to, the more motivated you'll be. This is why it's so important to have absolute clarity with regard to your goals in each area of your life, in order for you to be motivated to perform at your very best. An important point with regard to the ABC formula is that your behaviors are not guaranteed to achieve the consequences that you desire. But every behavior or action that you engage in will generate a consequence of some kind. One of the most important parts of understanding motivation and behavior is to realize that both actions and inactions have consequences. What you do as well as what you fail to do will have a consequence in your future, and sometimes the consequences can be dramatic and long-lasting. A good exercise in success is for you to write out a description of the type of person that you'd like to be, and the kind of life that you'd like to be living. The most powerful faculty that you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more accurately you can think about who you are and what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it, the more effective and successful you will be. The eighth law of success is the law of subconscious activity, and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that whatever thought or idea mixed with emotion you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. This means that whatever thought, idea or goal you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis and then add emotion to it, you can begin to change the behavior and circumstances of your life. This is a powerful idea and one that you can use immediately to begin changing your life. This is the starting point of what we call self-programming. It's the starting point of changing the way you think and the way you feel about yourself and your possibilities. Once you begin to change your thinking, 
you can begin to change your life. The key to success is to think and feel like a successful person. You can change your thoughts and feelings by changing the images and messages that you send to your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is like a giant computer that is constantly working to achieve whatever goals you give it. If you feed it positive thoughts and images, it will work to achieve positive results. If you feed it negative thoughts and images, it will work to achieve negative results. The subconscious mind doesn't care whether the thoughts and images that you give it are true or false. It just works to achieve whatever goals you give it. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind is the source of all your beliefs, attitudes, and habits. Your beliefs, attitudes, and habits are formed by the things that you repeatedly tell yourself. If you repeatedly tell yourself that you are a failure, you will begin to believe it. If you repeatedly tell yourself that you are a success, you will begin to believe that as well. If you repeatedly tell yourself that you are a success, and add emotion to it, you will begin to change your beliefs and attitudes. This is the starting point of self-programming. It's the starting point of changing the way you think and feel about yourself and your possibilities. Once you begin to change your thinking, you can begin to change your life. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind is always working to achieve the goals that you give it. Your subconscious mind is like a giant computer that is constantly working to achieve whatever goals you give it. If you feed it positive goals, it will work to achieve positive results. If you feed it negative goals, it will work to achieve negative results. The subconscious mind doesn't care whether the goals that you give it are good or bad. It just works to achieve whatever goals you give it. This is the starting point of self-programming. It's the starting point of changing the way you think and feel about yourself and your possibilities. Once you begin to change your thinking, you can begin to change your life. The fourth part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind is always working to achieve the goals that you give it. Your subconscious mind is like a giant computer that is constantly working to achieve whatever goals you give it. If you feed it positive goals, it will work to achieve positive results. If you feed it negative goals, it will work to achieve negative results. The subconscious mind doesn't care whether the goals that you give it are good or bad. It just works to achieve whatever goals you give it. This is the starting point of self-programming. It's the starting point of changing the way you think and feel about yourself and your possibilities. Once you begin to change your thinking, you can begin to change your life. The ninth law of success is the law of growth, which says that whatever you think about most will become the basis of your character. The more you think about your goals and your ideal life, the more you'll be motivated to take the actions necessary to achieve them. The more you think about your negative thoughts and feelings, the more you'll be held back from achieving your goals. The key to success is to keep your mind focused on your goals and to keep taking action toward them every single day. The more you think about your goals, the more motivated you'll be to take the actions necessary to achieve them. The tenth law of success is the law of attraction, which says that whatever you consistently think about with emotion will become your reality. The more you think about your goals and your ideal life, the more motivated you'll be to take the actions necessary to achieve them. The more you think about your negative thoughts and feelings, the more you'll be held back from achieving your goals. The key to success is to keep your mind focused on your goals and to keep taking action toward them every single day. The more you think about your goals, the more motivated you'll be to take the actions necessary to achieve them. The eleventh law of success is the law of vibration, which says that everything in the universe vibrates at a certain frequency. Your thoughts and feelings also vibrate at a certain frequency, and the more positive your thoughts and feelings, the higher your vibration will be. The key to success is to keep your vibration high by focusing on positive thoughts and feelings. The more you focus on positive thoughts and feelings, the more positive things will come into your life. The twelfth law of success is the law of action, which says that you must take action in order to achieve your goals. No matter how much you think about your goals or how high your vibration is, nothing will happen unless you take action. The key to success is to take action every single day. The more action you take, the closer you'll get to achieving your goals. The thirteenth law of success is the law of momentum which says that once you start taking action, it will become easier and easier to keep taking action. The key to success is to keep building momentum by taking action every single day. The more action you take, the more momentum you'll build, and the faster you'll achieve your goals. The fourteenth law of success is the law of attraction, which says that you attract into your life people, situations and opportunities that are in harmony with your thoughts and feelings. 
The key to success is to keep your thoughts and feelings positive. The more positive your thoughts and feelings, the more positive people, situations, and opportunities you'll attract into your life. The 15th law of success is the law of abundance, which says that there is more than enough of everything to go around. The key to success is to believe in abundance and to focus on what you want rather than what you don't want. The more you focus on abundance, the more abundance you'll attract into your life. The 16th law of success is the law of gratitude, which says that the more grateful you are for what you have, the more you'll have to be grateful for. The key to success is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude by focusing on the things that you're grateful for every single day. The more you focus on gratitude, the more things you'll have to be grateful for. The 17th law of success is the law of love, which says that love is the most powerful force in the universe. The key to success is to cultivate an attitude of love by focusing on loving yourself and others unconditionally. The more you focus on love, the more love you'll attract into your life. The 18th law of success is the law of giving, which says that the more you give, the more you'll receive. The key to success is to give freely and generously of your time, talents, and resources. The more you give, the more you'll receive in return. The 19th law of success is the law of karma, which says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The key to success is to always act with integrity and to treat others with kindness and respect. The more you give, the more you'll receive in return. The 20th law of success is the law of attraction which says that you attract into your life people, situations and opportunities that are in harmony with your thoughts and feelings. The key to success is to keep your thoughts and feelings positive. The more positive your thoughts and feelings, the more positive people, situations and opportunities you'll attract into your life. If you desire to earn or attain a certain amount of money and you think about it continually day and night, using every means possible to drive this desire or hope deep into your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind will begin committing more and more of its reserved capacity toward bringing that goal or desire into your life. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once you give it the proper commands, will trigger your reticular cortex and its function, the reticular activating system. Your reticular cortex is a small finger-like part of your brain that alerts you to events and circumstances around you that are consistent with your dominant desires or concerns. For example, if you decide that you want to buy a red sports car, this desire would signal to your reticular cortex that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere. Even a block away, you would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means of attaining one of them. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence, and you imbue this goal with intense desire, your reticular cortex will cause you to be extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you to earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might have been unaware of completely in the absence of having established this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, which controls your autonomic nervous system and all of your muscles, nerves, actions, and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California, Santa Barbara, has concluded that when you communicate with others, fully 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language, 38% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice, and only 7% of the message you send is contained in the actual words that you use. Your body language and tone of voice are largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you've sent to your subconscious mind as a result of the way you think and feel. For example, when you've had a success of any kind, you send a charge of emotional energy to your subconscious mind that tells it that you're a winner. For some time afterward, you walk, talk, act, and think like a winner. Your step will be brisker, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice, and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations, often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect with confidence will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, 
An attitude of positive self-expectancy goes hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk, talk, and act as though you believe the entire world was conspiring to help you achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone is often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by constantly looking for the good in every person, in every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to approach situations with a more positive, open, and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful, expect to win more times than you lose, and expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop, like courage, sincerity, and persistence, you tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity and largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on in the present is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. From the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance and to do the things that you've become accustomed to doing in the past. You eat the same foods for breakfast, you brush your teeth with the same toothpaste, you take the same route to work, you greet people with the same words, you go to lunch at the same time, you work in the same way. Now there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving your car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that can be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts to the law of habit, and the first of these is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change are bad habits, which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. It's therefore important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have and analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. Remember, one of the most important observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other, and nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your ball to go into the rough, you can override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. If you have a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your actions. It's by practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior that you drive this message into your subconscious mind, and you eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you wish to form. This brings us to the twelfth law, one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet, and that you inevitably attract into your life the people, events and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have. Whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion begins setting up a force field of mental energy 
that begins drawing towards you the things that you need to achieve that goal. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's contained in old folk sayings like, like attracts like, or like begets like, or birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that whatever you want, wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful, and that whatever you think, emotionalized, becomes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience into your life. In music, the law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. It explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room, and you hit the key of C on one of the pianos, and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating in perfect harmony, your resonance with the second string on the first piano. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people, and you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room. You'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible, and that person will have a tendency to gravitate towards you. Very often, Two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance that draws them toward each other and into conversation. By the same token, when you have a very clear goal or idea, you will tend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal. Another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite, which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted to people who are similar to you and repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people and why neither group finds the other group of very much interest. You can begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them to you. The thirteenth law of success is the law of choice, which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind, but in doing so, you are choosing every other part of your life, your thought control your reality. And since no one else but you can think for you, the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life. The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that you have complete freedom to think, and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. The choice is always up to you. The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you are not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. The fourteenth law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. The quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you'll be moment to moment, and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. The fifteenth law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. It's fully constant. The only constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing, even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed either. All progress requires change, and since change is happening in any case, you can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage of it. The law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better, but not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change, you will end up being the victim of change. Things will happen over which you have little or no control and you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions and behaviors to whatever occurs. Let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time, there was a young man from an average home with an average education, working at an average job, and who had an average group of friends. Like most average young men, he was primarily interested in girls, sports, and television. He liked to have a good time, and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. He looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle, and like most average people, he was going nowhere with his life. Then one day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up, or listened to an audio program, or attended a motivational seminar. Whatever it was, he wasn't the same afterward. 
he realized that he could choose to do and be something else. He applied the law of choice, and by the law of change, he realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish, and then began searching out the causes of the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself and his possibilities. He expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectations. He went to work on his thinking and began to dwell, by the law of concentration, on his ideal lifestyle. By the law of subconscious activity, he began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, he triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency, and he created a clear picture of his goals. By the law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new, improved inner world. His beliefs about himself began to change, and by the law of attraction, people and resources began to appear to help him move toward his goal. As he concentrated on his desires, his values and motivations changed, and he began developing the kind of habits that lead to success. In no time at all, by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success, he began moving forward at a rate that surprised even him, and so can you. The laws of success are based on the foundational principle that in order for you to succeed, you must first decide what success means to you. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality. Get off of Instagram and Snapchat and get off all these blogs. Get into something that can really move your life forward. Getting successful is not a magic trick. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is here. If you want to be successful, you have to change this. This has to change. It's not what makes it hard. It's your lack of belief that it can happen for you. So if you're at a place in your life and you aren't happy with it, you have to change some things. You have to make a conscious, interesting decision that you're going to change. And it's not dependent on anybody else. You get to decide if you're going to be rich, poor, mediocre, plentiful, happy, sad. It's really not important what the majority of people that are blogging are saying. As a matter of fact, bloggers are not relevant people. So when you spend so much time in the blog world, the Instagram world, the chat world, all of this, you're wasting valuable time. I was young, and I had what you have. You're the brightest group of young people that have come along in a long time, man. Millennials are absolutely brilliant because you all have technology. Oh God, Google, you can Google anything. You all have stuff at your fingertips that can make you great. But if you could combine your technology with your parents and your grandparents' work ethic, you could be rich. You could be rich, man. But you cannot erase the work ethic part. I hate it when I see young people wasting their time, wasting all this technology just sitting around in this world that's been created for you. That everything is instant. You've got to understand that success. You can't Google success. You can't Google it, man. I've seen stuff hopefully you'll never see. And I've seen some things I hope one day you do see. But go Google exposure. It ain't gonna take you nowhere. I have a life of convenience now. But in order to get at the life of convenience, you gotta have a very uncomfortable life. Stop trying to do everything the short way. Stop trying to figure out the easy way because it ain't gonna happen. You gotta get messed up sometimes. You gotta get dirty. You gotta get your feelings hurt. You gotta get disappointed. You gotta get told no. But at least then, when I see somebody trying and I tell them no, I try to at least give them something else. Once you get this, y'all, you can change everything. Negativity, you can protect yourself from negativity. And that's what stops most people from seeing it. It's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door. So I walk out as a positive. I get tired sometimes because I get mentally drained from my job at times. But to coach your mind from negativity, the way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple gratitude. Gratitude erases negativity. If you wake up in the morning and start having negative thoughts, I'm tripping. I just don't feel myself. Every time you feel in the middle of the day, if you feel yourself doing that, stop. Just stop for a second and start going over in your mind everything you have to be grateful for, everything you already have. You can walk, that's a blessing. You woke up, that's another blessing. The fact that you can see, think, reason, that's another blessing. You can go somewhere and get yourself something to eat. That's another blessing. The ability to dream is a blessing. Start coding your mind with gratitude. It can change everything for you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I want to unveil a secret that has the potential to transform your life in ways you never thought possible. 
It's a habit so powerful, so profound, that once you embrace it, you'll unlock a supply of untapped potential within yourself. A potential that will propel you to heights beyond your wildest imagination. In today's fast-paced world, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. To succumb to the pressures and demands of daily life. But amidst the chaos, there exists a habit, a simple yet profound practice, that has the power to set you apart from the crowd, to elevate you to a level of success and fulfillment that few ever attain. What is this habit, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you, it's the habit of discipline. Now you might be wondering what makes this habit so special. The answer lies in its transformative power, its ability to shape your thoughts, actions, and ultimately, your destiny. So, as we embark on this journey together today, I urge you to open your mind and your heart to the possibility of adopting this powerful habit. Allow yourself to imagine the extraordinary impact it can have on your life, the doors it can open, the opportunities it can create, the dreams it can turn into reality. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of the power of habit. Now let's delve in and discover the incredible potential that lies within each and every one of us to become truly powerful beyond belief. The journey to success is not a light stroll, but a challenging voyage that requires unwavering commitment to the path of discipline. With each step, we draw closer not only to our goals, but also to the best version of ourselves. Discipline is not a shackle that confines us, but the wings that lift us to unforeseen heights. It is the beacon that illuminates our path in the dark nights of uncertainty, steadfastly guiding us to the safe shores of success. In the annals of history, we find tales of giants whose achievements echoed through the ages. Behind every monumental feat, we discover the indelible footprint of discipline, forging legends that inspire and challenge all those who aspire to greatness. So today, in this sacred space of reflection, I invite each of you to embrace discipline as the catalyst for your own destiny. May every act of self-discipline be a brick that builds the bridge between your dreams and the reality you yearn to achieve. On this journey of discovery and conquest, let us always remember that discipline is not just a means to an end, but a loyal companion on the extraordinary journey that is life. With it by our side, we become architects of our destiny, sculpting success with the mastery of those who understand that greatness is the result of sustained discipline. May this discourse be the spark that ignites the flame of discipline in every present heart. And together, let us forge a future where success is the resounding echo of our efforts. Several years ago, I met a renowned authority in personal development, Jim Rohn. This expert uncovered principles of success, and by the time I met him, he had published four books, each containing 250 of these principles. I asked him which one he considered the most important, and he immediately said it was discipline, which he defined as the ability to force yourself to do what you should at the moment you should, whether you like the idea or not. After interviewing 500 of the wealthiest people in the United States, Napoleon Hill also concluded that discipline was the key to becoming rich. Tom Ziegler, the famous sales coach, once said, success depends on tons of discipline. Jim Rohn said, discipline weighs ounces, but regret weighs tons. Dr. Edward Banfield of Harvard University concluded that long-term perspective was the key to social and economic ascent. Over 50 years of research, Banfield found that people who achieved great success were able to delay short-term gratification to enjoy even greater rewards in the long term. The key word in this concept is sacrifice. Therefore, saving and investing in the present is essential for economic success in the future. Personal discipline involves being able to control yourself to master yourself, to eat the main course first and dessert last. But beware, this does not mean you cannot have enjoyable experiences, but rather that you should only try to live them once you have done the hard and necessary work and after finishing all your essential tasks. The reward for observing personal discipline comes immediately. Every time you force yourself to do the right thing, whether you like it or not, you will like yourself more and you will respect yourself more. Your self-esteem will increase, the image you have of yourself will improve, and your brain will release endorphins that will make you feel happy and proud. In fact, every time you force yourself to comply and do the right thing, you will receive rewards. Best of all, discipline is a habit that you can also learn through practice and repetition. To develop a medium complexity habit, you need to perform the action for 21 days without fail. Sometimes you can form a habit faster, 
but other times it takes longer. It all depends on you and how determined you are. A few years ago, a businessman named Herbert Gray began to investigate and search for what he called the common denominator of success. He interviewed successful people for 11 years and eventually concluded that it was people who formed the habit of doing what mediocre people did not do. It turns out that successful people don't like doing those things either, but they force themselves to do them because they realize that's the price they must pay if they want to succeed. Rich DeVos, co-founder of Amway, once said, There are many things in life that I don't like doing, such as finding new customers or selling and spending nights and weekends building a business. Nevertheless, I do them because that's the only way I can later do the things I truly enjoy. Every time you exercise your personal discipline, you strengthen all your other positive qualities. And similarly, if you are weak in discipline, the weakness spreads to all other areas of your personality. Ladies and gentlemen, let's embark on seven disciplines that hold the power to elevate every aspect of your life. Disciplines that you can cultivate within yourself. First and foremost is the discipline of clear thinking. Thomas Edison once remarked that thinking was the most challenging discipline of all, a sentiment echoed by many throughout history. Indeed, there exists a spectrum of individuals, those who actively engage in deep thinking, those who believe they do, and those who shy away from the mental exertion it demands. Take a moment to ponder the pivotal issues and dilemmas in your life. Carve out extended periods to do so, be it 30, 60, or 90 minutes. As the great Peter Drucker noted, Hasty decisions often lead to regrettable outcomes. Instead, deliberate over your family, career, finances, and other fundamental aspects with utmost care. Sit quietly, embrace solitude, and allow your thoughts to roam freely. Aristotle famously stated, Wisdom is the combination of experience and reflection. The deeper your contemplation, the richer the insights you glean from your experiences. Regular periods of solitude activate your superconsciousness and awaken intuition, guiding you towards clarity and resolution. Consider maintaining a journal, jotting down the intricacies of your challenges. Sometimes the act of articulating your thoughts on paper can display solutions. Engage in activities like walking or exercise for 30 to 60 minutes. They foster clarity of thought and bolster decision-making prowess. Additionally, Look for counsel from a trusted confidant, someone detached from the emotional entanglements of your predicament. A fresh perspective can often illuminate new pathways and redefine your understanding of the A situation. Always challenge assumptions. Ask yourself, what am I assuming? What assumptions underpin my perspective on this situation? By scrutinizing these underlying beliefs, you open the door to overwhelming insights and transformative growth. Alec McKenzie, a time management specialist, once wrote, Wrong assumptions are the origin of all failures. The second discipline that will help you succeed is to set a goal every day. This practice has transformed my life and the lives of thousands of people. Now that you know that focus and concentration are essential aspects of success, start by asking yourself, what do I really want to do with my life? Ask yourself this question again and again until you have a clear answer. Imagine you have $20 million in cash, but you only have 10 years left to live. What would you change immediately? Imagine that nothing limits you. Imagine that you have a magic wand that gives you access to all the time, money, education, experience, and contacts. What would you do? I'll give you an exercise. Buy a notebook and write in it every day. Write down 10 goals in PPP format. Positive, present, and personal. Start each goal with the word I followed by an action verb. For example, I earn X amount of dollars by such date. Every day before starting the day, rewrite your top 10 goals in the present tense, as if you had already achieved them. And only rewrite the goals on a new piece of paper, without looking at the previous one. In other words, rewrite them from memory. Watch how they develop and change over time. And as you rewrite them, many people tell me that this discipline of setting goals every day, has changed their lives faster than they imagined. Once I gave a talk in Galveston, Texas, and the person who introduced me stood up and said, I have to tell you about my experience with Brian Tracy. Then he took out a notebook and continued. When I met him, he told me to write down my goals every day, and I started doing it immediately. That completely changed my life. He explained, waving the notebook in the air. 
I achieved all the goals I wrote down. I had never done anything so powerful in my life. Do it. It's an excellent discipline. The third discipline is to manage your time daily. Every minute spent planning saves 10 in execution. The more you plan, the more you will make the most of your time, and the more you will achieve. Imagine this. If you spend between 10 and 12 minutes every morning planning your day, because that's all it would take, you would save 120 minutes that you could use to achieve your goals. That is two hours daily. This represents a 25% increase in productivity, and all as a result of planning your day early. Start by making a list of everything you will do. The best time to write the list is the night before because that way, your subconscious can work on it while you sleep. Organize the list by priorities. Before you start working, review it and analyze everything you have to do. Define what is most and least important. Practice the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of your results come from 20% of your activities. Use the ABCD method to establish priorities. An A task is something you must do without fail, because not completing it could have serious consequences. A B task is something you should do. Not completing it only entails mild consequences. A C task is something nice to do, but it doesn't really matter whether you do it or not. A D task is something you delegate, and you know you should delegate as many tasks as possible. Finally, an E task is something you eliminate. So eliminate everything you can to free up as much time as possible. Once you have written A, B, C, D, or E next to your tasks, organize the list by A1, A2, A3, and then B1, B2, B3, etc. Early in the morning, start with task A1. And from that moment on, form the discipline of focusing absolutely on it until it is completed. The discipline of managing time well extends to all other forms of personal discipline and has immediate rewards because it gives you better results as well as long-term satisfaction in terms of the quality of your life and work. The fourth is the discipline of courage. This requires you to do what you should, to face your fears instead of avoiding or evading them. As I mentioned earlier, the greatest obstacle to success is the fear of failure, which is expressed in that feeling that makes you say, I can't. Courage is a habit that is developed by practicing it whenever necessary. Emerson said, Do what you fear, and your fear will surely die. Make a habit of confronting your fears instead of avoiding them. Every time you face and approach it, especially if it involves another person, group or situation, fear diminishes, and you become braver and bolder. Actor Glenn Ford once said, If you don't do what you fear, fear will control your life. Repeat these words to yourself. I can do it. I can do it. Do it over and over until you gather enough courage and confidence in yourself. This phrase will nullify your fears. The fifth discipline serves to develop healthy habits. Your goal should be to live 100 years with impeccable health. Design and imagine your ideal body. How would it look if it were perfect in every way? This will be your goal. The key to health and fitness can be summed up in five words. Eat less and exercise more. Develop the discipline of exercising every day, even if you can only take a short walk. It's best to exercise in the morning as soon as you wake up and before you have time to think about it. Jump out of bed and get moving. If you do it for 21 days, it will become part of your daily routine for the rest of your life. The sixth discipline is regular saving and investing, two topics I've already talked about. Decide today to get out of debt, stay that way, and achieve financial independence. Make the decision and stop longing, waiting, and praying. Just do it. Your goal and everyone else's should be to achieve financial independence as soon as possible in their lives. This requires continuous financial discipline that you must exercise with every dollar you earn. The key is to save 10%, 15%, or even 20% of your income throughout your life. If you're already in debt, start by saving 1% of what you earn and form the discipline of living on the remaining 99% until it becomes a habit. Form the discipline of living with what's left. It is essential that you change the way you think. Stop saying to yourself, I love to spend and start saying, I love to save. Move from, I like to spend, to I love to save. I'm fascinated to see my money multiply and accumulate every month. Soon, your mindset will change, and you will start thinking like successful and wealthy people do. The seventh discipline is that of continuous learning. Remember that to earn more, you have to learn more. Jim Rohn said the famous phrase, work on yourself as much as you work for your boss. Personal development is fundamental. 
So, read texts about your field for 30 to 60 minutes every day. This will translate into one book a week and 50 books a year. Listen to audio programs in your car when you go from one place to another. This will add between 500 and 1,000 hours a year. Attend seminars and take courses from experts in your field. A brilliant idea you hear in a course could save you years of intense work. Persistence equals personal discipline. The greatest test of personal discipline is persistence in the face of adversity. You can force yourself to complete your tasks no matter how you feel. Courage has two parts. The courage itself to start a project, to get something going despite not having a guarantee of success. The second part is the courage to endure, to persist when you feel discouraged and tired and want to give up. Your persistence represents how much or how little you believe in yourself and your ability to succeed. This means that the more you believe in the goodness and suitability of what you do, the more persistent you will be. The more you persist, the more you will tend to believe in yourself and what you do. Napoleon Hill said, For a man or woman's character, persistence is what coal is toll. Every time you persist despite feeling like quitting, you become a stronger and more solid person because you take control of your own character. And over time, you become unstoppable. As we draw this discussion to a close, I want to leave you with a powerful reminder. The habit we've explored today has the potential to release a level of power and potential within you that you may never have imagined possible. By adopting this habit, by making it an integral part of your daily routine, you're tapping into a supply of strength, resilience and determination that knows no bounds. But remember, true power doesn't come from external sources. It comes from within. It's about raising the right mindset adopting the right habits, and taking consistent action towards your goals. As you embark on this journey of self-discovery and growth, I urge you to stay committed, stay focused, and never lose sight of the incredible potential that lies within you. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of the power of habit. Now, armed with this knowledge and insight, go forth and adopt the habit that will make you truly powerful beyond belief. The world is yours for the taking. Seize it with all the strength and determination you possess. Godspeed, and may your journey be filled with endless possibilities and abundant success. Napoleon Hill said, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Everything that you accomplish in your outer world is a result of your self-concept. Because of this, you always operate in a manner consistent with your self-concept, whether positive or negative. Even if your self-concept is made up of erroneous beliefs about yourself or your world, as far as you're concerned, these are facts. The worst of all beliefs are self-limiting beliefs. If you believe it, you will act as if you were deficient in that particular area of talent or skill. Overcoming self-limiting beliefs and self-imposed limitations is often the biggest obstacle standing between you and the realization of your full potential. Thomas Edison was expelled from school in the sixth grade. His parents were told that it would be a waste of time to spend any money educating him because he was not particularly smart or capable of being taught anything. Edison went on to become the greatest inventor of the modern age. Almost everyone has had the experience of mastering a skill in an area where they thought they had no ability and being quite surprised at themselves. The fact is you have more potential than you could ever use in your entire lifetime. No one is better than you and no one is smarter than you. People are just smarter or better in different areas at different times. Each person is capable of achieving excellence in some way, in some area. Your responsibility to yourself is to cast off all these self-limiting beliefs and accept that you are an extraordinarily capable, talented person. The starting point of unlocking more of your potential is for you to identify your self-limiting beliefs. I have filing drawers full of letters and emails from people who had never heard this idea of self-limiting beliefs before, but once they heard it, they changed their entire attitudes toward themselves. They began to see themselves as far more competent and capable in key areas of their lives than they had ever been before. In no time at all, they began transforming their lives and changing their results. Many of them became millionaires and multimillionaires. They went from the bottom of their companies to the top after they changed their beliefs about themselves and their personal potentials. They set bigger goals and threw their whole hearts into achieving them. By questioning their beliefs and by refusing to accept that they were limited in any way, they took complete charge of their lives and created new realities for themselves. If you absolutely believe that you are destined to be a big success, you will walk, talk, 
and act as if everything that happens to you in life is part of a great plan to make you successful. Top people look for the good in every situation, no matter how many reversals and setbacks they experience. They expect to get something good out of everything that happens to them. If your beliefs are positive enough, you will seek the valuable lesson in every setback or difficulty. When you start off, you may not feel like the great success that you desire to be. But if you act as if you were already the person you desire to be, with the qualities and talents that you desire to have, your actions will generate the feelings that go with them. Pick the most successful people in your field and use them as your role models. If possible, go to them and ask them for advice on how to get ahead more rapidly, and whatever advice they give you, follow it immediately. In no time at all, you will be one of the top people yourself. Your focus must be on creating the beliefs within yourself that are consistent with the great success you want to be in your outer world. Reprogram your subconscious mind for success by creating the mental equivalent in everything you do or say. You develop new beliefs by taking actions consistent with those beliefs. Act as if you already believe that you have these capabilities and competencies. You should only think and talk about the things that are moving you toward becoming the person you want to be and toward achieving the goals that you want to achieve. Make a decision this very day to challenge and reject any self-limiting beliefs that you might have that could be holding you back. You might ask your friends and family members if they see any negative beliefs that you might have. There are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, act as if you were one of the most competent and highly respected people in your field. How would you think, act, and feel differently from today? Second, imagine that you have a goal in touch with regard to money. If you are an extremely competent money manager, how would you handle your finances differently from the way you handle them today? And third, identify the self-limiting beliefs that could be holding you back. How would you act if these self-limiting beliefs were completely untrue? We all know what enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm. The enthusiasm that runs deep. The enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence. Created by purpose. Created by genuine willingness to help other people. People call it genuine enthusiasm, because they know that what you say and the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable is expertise. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence and skills to be the best that you can possibly be in the training, do the best you possibly can. Here was the next one on my list, that is preparation. Preparation of course involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. Prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Will not only look for fortune, prepare yourself, and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Well prepared, prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. There are four powerful mental laws that you need to know. The first is the law of belief. Whatever you believe with feeling becomes your reality. If you absolutely believe that you are destined to be a great success, then there is nothing in the world that can stop you from becoming that great success. Peter Daniels, who started off working on the streets, became very wealthy. He studied the lives of 500 men and women who became successful. He read their biographies and looked for the common denominator of success. He finally found the common thread. The common thread was every one of those people always believed in themselves. They always believed that they were going to be a big success in life. They always expected to do well, no matter what happens. Everything is going to conspire together to make you a great success. And if you absolutely believe that and absolutely expect that, everything is going to help you, that will become your reality. The reason why we do not achieve greatly is we hold ourselves back by our own beliefs. We over-exaggerate negative events. The second law is the law of expectations. Whatever you expect with confidence becomes your own self-fulfilling prophecy. If you expect to be successful, you eventually will be successful. Positive successful, winning individuals have an attitude of positive expectancy. The greatest of all attitudes, the catalyst that causes your potential to unlock, 
almost like a chemical catalyst that causes an explosive effect, is confident expectations. An attitude of confident expectations transforms your attitude toward your world. If you always expect something good, you'll never be disappointed, and it has a total transforming effect on your attitude. Now here's an exercise for you. Repeat throughout the day these words. I believe that something wonderful is going to happen to me today. Now say that to yourself every single morning when you get up and say that something wonderful is going to happen to you that day. It's the most amazing damn thing. You've set up a force field of positive expectations, and something wonderful happens to you. The third law is the law of correspondence. This law says that your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. Your outer world of wealth, work, relationships, and health will always be a reflection of what is going on inside you. To become the person that you would like to be, you create a mental picture of your newly conceived self, and if you continue to hold it, the day will come when you are in reality that person. When you employ your imagination properly, you see yourself doing a thing, and you go ahead and do it. It's the doing of the thing you have pictured to yourself that brings it into actual existence. However, it is very difficult for the average person to concentrate for any length of time, to say nothing of holding on to a mental picture for any great period. The results will be pure or complex, depending upon the original seed and the attention which you give it. In other words, plant the right kind of seed and habitually feed it with strong affirmative thought always directed toward the same end. It will grow into a mighty force, finding ways and means of overcoming all obstacles. The final law, which links them all, is the law of attraction. This law says that you are a living magnet, and that you attract people and circumstances into your life that harmonize with your dominant thought. The more you think about something and the more excited you are about achieving it, the more you will attract it into your life, like a magnet attracts iron filings. And the more emotion attached to a thought, the greater is the intensity of the vibration. The more emotion you have, if you think about what you're going to have for lunch, it has very little vibrational effect. But if you think about someone you love, or a goal that you want to achieve or something you want to accomplish or even something you're afraid of, it has a tremendous emotional effect, like turning up the emotional power. If you want to be really successful, and you see successful people and you start to resonate with their accomplishments, you start to become more like them. So don't talk about things you don't want, because your mind is so powerful. It's this powerful engine that is sending out your vibrations, and attracting into your life people and circumstances in harmony with the things you're saying, and the thoughts that you're thinking.